Well, hello, everyone, and here we are again. It's Tuesday noon, and you know what that means. That means it is our webinar from Business Performance USA, and we're always honored to have you here as our guests, and we know that you're going to learn a great deal from today's presentation, which is the basic truths about background screening, and this is part 10. They have been faithful. Um, Nancy Lynn Roberts and Matt Graham in producing a webinar on a monthly basis about background screening, which is really an interesting topic. I found these very informative and very interesting. And, and Matt's going to talk about something we can all relate to today, name matching, the necessary steps and frequent problems with knowing your applicant. And as somebody that has uh, bumped into my name, never the, never a person with my name, only my name everywhere out there. Uh, that is somebody else, and one day maybe I'll actually meet them. I think this is going to be a great topic for us today. Now, I want to let you know that Business Performance produces these weekly webinars, again, like I said, every Tuesday at noon central, and we really strive to provide business insights on a variety of topics that are important to business professionals, whether you own your own company, whether you're working in a company as an employee, or whether you're working as a leader, a major leader in a company. These are topics that are pertinent and informative for you and very insightful as well. Now, who we are, Business Performance USA, is a voluntary association, and we provide online business information exchange. So all you need to do, you can become a member and you don't have to pay, which is nice, right? You can meet people from across the U.S. and be engaged in business conversations on all kinds of topics. And you can become a member just by going to businessperformanceusa.org. One of the many benefits you get is that you'll be able to hear on demand. That means that anytime you want, anywhere you are, as long as you've got your smartphone or your smart tablet or your PC, you can go tune in to these on-demand webinars and find out about things that are really pertinent for issues that you have in your business place. So uh, again, I've told you what our our topic is for today. And now let me introduce myself. I'm your host for today, and I'm Cynthia Stewart. I'm managing partner for Evermore Services, and I'm your partner in building tomorrow's businesses today. And uh, we have in front of you that wonderful picture of Matt Graham. He is a, a lawyer as his Esquire, as you can see behind his name. He's vice president of operations at Track One Technology. And ta Track One Technology is a firm that is, they are experts, experts, and they have one of the best and this is my saying this, they have one of the best nationwide background screening firms out there uh, because they really know that business and they have the IT technology to tap into databases across this nation. And so when you do a background screening with them, you can make sure that they're going to get the right information to you. So I I want you to know about this firm, Track One Technology, and they they uh, Matt is one of our executive presenters, and he has over 15 years of experience in employment practices. And the thing about Matt is that he's got employment practices, he's a lawyer, and he's really a guru at IT. So he uh, is a blend of some pretty powerful stuff, I might say. He joined Track One at the beginning of 2011, and he helped the company to become one of the only he's only 42 companies that are actually have accreditation by the National Association of Professional Background Screeners. So when you think about, I know in the city where I am, there are hundreds of companies that claim to be background screeners, but uh, Track one is one of the 42 in the whole country. So uh, think about that. There may only be one per state. So you really want to do your due diligence when you're looking for a background screening company and find one that is accredited. Matt serves on the board of the Best Practices Committee of NAPBS, and he co-chairs the Data Breach Prevention Subcommittee. And don't you know that how important that data breach is when you think about companies like Target? So a uh, very good association and one that you want your background screener to be accredited by. He Matt is only one of 40 people to be certified at the advanced level in the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So the, all that says is Matt knows his stuff. 
And um, so just want to make sure that you make this hour worth your time. There is a question feature on the control panel. I'll be monitoring that. So if you have any questions, just be sure to go ahead and type in your question. And at the appropriate time, I'll ask Matt um, what that question is. So also feel free if you need to, to to just send me an email about any workplace issue, and I can direct you to resources that we have on our site or answer it myself. I'm Cynthia at businessperformanceusa.org. And uh, again, you can watch this webinar and all the others we've recorded past this past year on many topics at businessperformanceusa.org. There you go. And with that, Matt, I'm going to go ahead and pass the screen over to you. And then once I hear you, I'll go on mute and you can begin. And I'll let you know when I see your screen. Okay, it's up. Very good. Great. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And I just have to say I am so glad that uh, we do not use webcams during these presentations because right now I'm blushing uncontrollably. Um, <laughs> such a lovely introduction and so many nice things said about uh, track one and myself, so I really appreciate that. Um, Cynthia's right. We've been doing these for quite a while now. I'm looking here at this slide that shows that we started this back in September of last year and that we're up to number 10. Uh, just proves that the days are long and the years are short. Um, gone through quite a few of these and uh, I'll allude to maybe some of the topics that we've previously covered as you kind of peruse this list um, as we go through today's presentation. But what we wanted to do today is really kind of focus in on one particular aspect of background screening and moving beyond one of my favorite and maybe, maybe the uh, best way to describe it is my comfort zone in terms of the compliance and really looking at some of the mechanics involved. Uh, so today's presentation is uh, ab about name matching. And so really what that gets to is, you know, who is the person that you have in front of you? Um, it's more important now than ever really to understand and, and know the people that you're bringing into your organizations. It's such a critical uh, thing. I mean, you're in inviting them inside the walls. You're, you're giving them access to information about your organization. And in some cases that involves intellectual property and uh, maybe access to financial records. So there's a real sense of uh, an extension of trust there as people are coming into your organization. So uh, a president uh, once said, trust but verify. So this is kind of that verification process. You need to understand who the people are when they're coming into your organization. And one of the really uh, simple ways to do that is through a, a background check. And so that's kind of where we come in. And so what we're looking at with the background check process is you, you uh, need to, to verify the identity of the individual. That's one of the important things. And so that's what we're looking at when we're talking about name matching is that you have to understand that uh, one of the secrets, I guess, I can let you in on at this point with, uh, with background checks is the background checks are not really matched on social security number. Um, it's, it seems like that would be an obvious thing um, since that, that number is kind of so ubiquitous. It follows us around everywhere. It's on most major documents. But when it comes down to the, um, the aspect of uh, background checks, the, the social security number is rarely involved, except in one limited context, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, so understanding that the criminal records are matched on name shows you that it's all that much more important to understand that you're using the right name. And that might seem like a, a, a silly thing, but um, take me for example. My, my full name is Robert Matthew Graham, and, but I go by Matt. I've, I've never really used my first name except in, uh, on, on legal documents. Um, so I'm, I'm known as Matt, I, I go by my middle name, but um, one of the things that we'll look at in a little bit, there's a lot of different variations on, on Matt. As I said, my full name is Robert Matthew, but I go by Matt, so it's a shortened version. Uh, so it, it's understanding that there are name variants and, uh, and, and understanding what to look for when you do the criminal record searches that uh, makes this issue so important. 
So the idea that name matching is, is simple really uh, couldn't, couldn't be further from the truth. Um, as, I just, as I just mentioned, there's a lot of different variants that, uh, that come into play um, with, uh, think about Robert, Rob, Robbie, Bob, uh, so a lot of, lot of variations there. Um, and, and so it's, like I said, it's, it's important that you understand the, the variations. And so one way that you can um, uh, address this issue, and when we're talking about uh, names and, and dates of birth and, and other things, this kind of falls under the category of, of PII. You may have seen that acronym thrown around a little bit. And that basically just stands for personally identifiable information. Uh, coming from the, the data breach prevention world, as, as Cynthia mentioned in the introduction, uh, every state, I'll save about three, has a, a statute that talks about what has to happen when there's a data breach. It's data breach notification laws. And you can find a really good definition of PII in most of those statutes. And in a lot of cases, that's defined as the, the full last name and any combination, you know, first letter, first initial, full uh, first name, and in combination with one or more of the following. And that usually throws in things like a driver's license number or social security number, anything that would really help you positive, uh, identify an individual. So when we talk about PII, you'll see that abbreviation throughout the remainder of the, of the webinar today. That's really what we're talking about is, uh, is things that will help you identify an individual. So as I mentioned, the, the, the complexity um, with the, uh, the information be, being presented, you have to understand that the, uh, the way to address this is, and again, this seems like very simple, but think about your onboarding process for just a minute. I would imagine that you have some sort of paper application that an applicant fills out. Um, you're probably going to scan their driver's license and a social security card for your I-9 requirements or your E-Verify. But are you really looking at that information? Are you looking at the driver's license copy or the social security card copy when you're plugging in information? Or are you just looking at the application that the individual filled out? And that's critical, because think about that for a second. So if I were to put Matt Graham on my application, because that's what I want to be called when I start working here, um, but all of the criminal records would be filed under my legal name of Robert Graham, what's going to happen there? And so that's, that's why it's very important to not take the applicant's word for it, uh, but to look at the official legal documentation that an applicant presents. Um, so making sure that you're looking at that information when you're submitting the, the background check is, is critical. The other thing that you probably should do that you may not be doing is ask on your application for any former names or alias names or nicknames that, may, uh, that the applicant may use. Uh, it's, it's especially important in the case of, of maiden names. Uh, oftentimes uh, there's a name change at, at the time uh, a woman gets married and you know, they could have lived a, a good portion of their life with a, a, another name, and at the time of a, any type of criminal conviction, whatever legal name at the time would, would be tagged to those records. So making sure that you collect that information um, and that you are running background checks based on that information uh, is, is very important. So let's look a little bit more at the concept of, of PII. We talked about you know, exactly what that means. Um, when you, especially in, in light of the, uh, the target data breach, as uh, Cynthia mentioned, that some of this stuff is hitting the popular press and people are becoming more familiar with these acronyms and things like PII is kind of becoming synonymous with uh, privacy. Uh, but one of the challenges that we're kind of facing right now in, in, in the background screening industry is that uh, some of this PII or the personally identifying information is being redacted or removed from court records because of these privacy issues. So uh, because these are public records, anybody that uh, cares to go down to a courthouse or in some cases hop online and, and pull up criminal records, um, this information is public. So it's, you can see maybe now why a social security number can't be part of those records. Um, because that information, uh, you know, combined with the date of birth and a full name gives an identity thief uh, all the information they need to take advantage of someone. So 
what we're seeing is an is a an, an, a trend really with uh, most court systems removing things like social security number from the records. And in some cases, they've decided that date of birth is also too much information to have in the public record. And so in they're, they're removing maybe, say, the month and the, and the day from the date of birth, leaving only the year. So now think, think about it for a second. Um, I know Cynthia mentioned that uh, she has a doppelganger, perhaps, uh, in, in town, and, and I do as well. There's another Matt Graham. I, I haven't met him, but uh, I, I do know that he exists because I've seen his name uh, on, on some signs at, a, at an office downtown Tulsa. Uh, so think about it for a minute. The more common the name, uh, the more likely you are to run into uh, people with, with that same name. So uh, somebody like a, a Tom Johnson or a Brad Smith, you know, names like that, uh, you can understand how you can maybe start getting that person confused with the the other, um, and if you have nothing but a, a year of birth to go by to differentiate, uh, to disambiguate, one of my favorite words by the way, um, it it gets a little complicated. And so with background check companies, we have to look for other information that can help us distinguish one person from another. Uh, so one of the ways that you can overcome this is to, you know, go beyond just a, a standard criminal search that that may be name and, and uh, date of birth match only. There's a lot of services that um, uh, that can that background check companies like Track One can provide that will help provide additional information that can help you determine one uh, Brad Smith from another. And so some of the ways that we've done that and some of the ways that we can overcome uh, things like we've talked about earlier with Rob and, and Robert and, and Matt and Matthew um, is, you know, we have developed and, and most companies have developed a way to check for those other names as, as the, uh, the online portions are being done. Um, so think about this for a moment. It's... Uh, when we when we look at our system, we have uh, 29 different variants on the name Roberts and 33 variations of Matthew. And so, for the, for you math nerds out there, you can take the uh, the 29 first names and the and the 33 middle names. I think that's uh, 62. And to come up with the permutations of possible variants on that. It's a complex formula, but trust me, the answer is uh, 3,782 different possible permutations of all the variants on Robert Matthew. Um, so fortunately, technology has provided us a way to very quickly scan for all of those names uh, when we're doing our online research. And so we have that built into the system. And um, you know, names are, are evolving. Uh, I guess you can look to Hollywood for a, a, a prime example of that. Things that you not, might not have expected to be names are kind of becoming names, and you can see variants and uh, popular artists are putting dollar signs in their names, and so I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work from a legal standpoint, but uh, all that basically to say is that our, our team is constantly looking for new variants and coming up with uh, new new things to tie together. So when you do a search for Robert, uh, you can make sure that all, all the uh, different variations are, are being uh, taken into account. So what I'm going to go through now is really 10 steps that can help you uh, come, basically do a, an effective background check program uh, taking into account all the different uh, challenges that we see with uh, with name matching. So the 10 steps, starting with step number one, uh, basically is just decide that you're going to have a comprehensive background screening program. Uh, and when I mentioned earlier that there are some things that you can do going beyond just the standard uh, criminal search, uh, one of the important things, and when I, I said that there were there was at least one exception where the social security number comes into play, is doing a social security number trace. Uh, different companies will have different names for that and different varieties of it, but basically what that is is taking the applicant's social security number and then running that through a database, and in most cases what it will do is provide you an address history uh, associated with that social security number. And hopefully, if the service is, is worth its metal, it will also provide you some form of confirmation 
that the social security number matches the name that has been presented. Um, and in some cases, we'll also validate that with the date of birth. Uh, and, and it will also p possibly tell you whether or not that social security number is on the, the master death record. So uh, that in itself will help you determine whether or not the information that's been presented to you in total kind of matches up. If you, if you get an, a report back that says that name doesn't match that social security number or the date of birth may be wrong, that can give you some indications as to, uh, you know, either go back and verify with the applicant that the information has been provided uh, correctly or, uh, you know, it may be an indication that, that uh, potential fraud is about to take place. So combining that with a, uh, with a criminal record search is important because when you start getting results back from those criminal records, oftentimes, even though the identifying information is being increasingly redacted, what you will find is the, app, uh, the uh, I guess, the holder of that criminal record's uh, address at the time. And if that address matches up with something in your criminal uh, or your social security number trace, then you can start piecing things together. Uh, if you have a criminal record that returns based on the name and the date of birth, uh, perhaps maybe only the year of birth, and it's a, it's a result from California, and your applicant has never lived in California, and you know there's maybe no other indication that they've even visited California, then again, those are things that you can start using to, to, to slowly whittle away some of these uh, name match only results. So once you've decided to embark on a, uh, a comprehensive background screening plan, the, the, the next choice is to how are you going to do that and, and whom are you going to hire for that. And we would always recommend that you look for an accredited provider. Uh, Cynthia did a really good job of introducing that concept. Um, our industry association, the group responsible for putting together that standard is known as the National Association of Professional Background Screeners, NAPBS. Uh, so you can go to NAPBS.com and you can find a list of accredited screening providers there at that site. So step three is to understand your uh, obligations really under the, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And any of the nine webinars that we've covered so far, um, you can go back to those and, and look at some of those in-depth uh, uh, requirements. But ultimately, you know, what you can boil that down to is you have to make sure that your applicants are aware that background screening is being done. You have to disclose the fact. You have to authorize. You have to get their authorization. Um, and then there are some rules to follow uh, once you start using results and making decisions. But uh, you know, we'll we'll save that for the previous webinars, and you can go back and educate yourselves on on what those obligations are. So step four, as we mentioned, it's important that you gather all the information that you're going to need to conduct your background checks from your applicants and not just taking their word for it, not just getting information that's uh, you know, handwritten on a, on a form somewhere, but it's really important that you go back to those official legal documents and, and use the information that's input on those as the information uh, that you submit to your background check provider. That's going to be your, your number one best way to uh, make sure that you're starting with the right information. Uh, as I mentioned, really it's the, the, the criminal records are matched on name and date of birth, so even transposing a digit, uh, a single digit on the year of birth uh, could, could, uh, could cause you to miss information. So making sure that you're using the, the right information is, is step four. Uh, a lot of times people try to take shortcuts and um, I know whenever I go to a website and see a bunch of fields on a form, I, I look for the ones that have the little red asterisk. You know the one I'm talking about, the one that says this is a required field and anything that's not required, I'm just going to skip it. Well, that can be uh, a, a bit of a problem when you're talking about background checks. Uh, middle name is one of those fields that is sometimes not required because you know some people don't have them. Um, some people like me go by their middle name, so it's a, it's a critical piece. So if you're not filling in all the possible information about your applicants when you're conducting your background check, you could be missing something, especially when you're talking about uh, common names. So that Brad Smith, if you know it was a Brad Edward Smith versus a Brad William Smith, that can make a big difference. Uh, e and W, most often when you're talking about criminal records, if there is a middle name, uh, that will be in the in the file. 
So right there is a is a quick way for you to uh, differentiate or disambiguate between the two Brad Smiths. So making sure that you're filling out all your forms, and if there is no middle name, uh, depending on the background check company, there may be a different way to handle that. Um, sometimes if you're if you put in the if you put in none actually or NMA no or NMN no middle name, those will actually go into your search criteria. So just make sure you understand. From your your background check company, what the criteria is and uh, what what should be handled or how it should be handled if there is no no middle name. So step six, as we mentioned before, um, you know there's a lot of variants uh, on names, and so you want to make sure that either your background check company with the product that you're ordering by default includes all those potential alias names or nicknames. Or in the case, uh, in sometimes uh, maiden names, th those have to be run as a separate search. Uh, so just understand that whatever name that comes up uh, in in the information that you're gathering from your applicant, you probably need to go ahead and run a criminal record on those. Uh, in the case of maiden names, there's not always going to be a, a a transfer of information from one name to another. Uh, the other thing too is on sometimes when you run those social security number uh, traces, they will provide you a list of aliases, um, and so it's important to 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 run checks on those as well. So any names that come up, make sure that you're trying to uh, gather as much name uh, or as much information as possible on those additional names. Step seven, we've kind of covered this because it's it just it's such an essential step is the making sure that you uh, have a valid social security number and a driver's license number. Uh, even if your uh, individual is not going to be uh, driving for you, sometimes the driver's license verification can help uh, because it will provide some some additional verification. Uh, in some cases, address history also comes up with that. So. Uh, just, again, using whatever you can at your disposal to uh, to, to gather up uh, the identifying information and providing that to the background check company. As I mentioned, with the uh, with the with the common names, you're likely going to get results that uh, even after you've looked at all the information that uh, that you can. Uh, you're, you're likely to get some results that don't belong to your particular applicant uh, just because of the common names and just because of so many courts redacting information. Uh, and, and let's say your applicant has an address history that covers two states and the criminal results are from those two states. Uh, so even though that you, you don't have a 100% match, you have enough at this point that you at least need to do some additional follow-up. And, and that's really what step eight is about, is before you're taking action on, on name match only records, uh, or even with a, a name and just a date of birth match, you, you may need to go back and as, ask your applicants some additional information, ask them whether or not they've had any uh, uh, associations with these, with these states. I know that it seems a little, little strange I mean, going back and ask the applicant because, well, they're probably just going to lie, right? You'd be surprised. Um, a lot of people, once confronted with a, a, a criminal past, once they believe that information has come up on a background check, will pretty much tell you everything. Um, so don't, uh, you know, don't approach it with a negative attitude. Like, of course, I can't find this out because they're just going to lie. Uh, it, it doesn't hurt to ask, and it doesn't hurt to follow up. And that's that's really what we're talking about here. Is just digging a little bit deeper. So on step nine, as we mentioned, you know, doing more than just the criminal background check. Um, if you get more information on the front end, it's much more likely that uh, you'll have fewer problems on on the back end. And that seems a little, uh, you know, like like you're using a, a, a sledgehammer to kill a fly. But so we're not talking about doing a, a, a full uh, investigative uh, consumer report. Really, what we're talking about is just using some of the basic tools at your disposal, and most often times they're they're inexpensive searches, uh, things that uh, the social security number trace, uh, a, a motor vehicle record search, or um, you know even just doing some some multiple searches on on the various names. Uh, if you like, I said, if you spend more time on the front end, it'll it'll work out for you in the long run. 
And so step 10 is, is looking at all the information in total. And so th that's really important because most companies, when they run all of these various components, they'll have their own little sections. Um, and you, you really need somebody that will look at the entire report because if you notice that the driver's license returns with a middle initial that doesn't match something that returns from your social security number trace, you've got some disparities there. Um, things that will either cause you to go back and ask some additional questions, or in some cases you may even have to go back and run some additional queries, uh, ad additional reports. So really the, the idea is that once you have a, a complete background check, you have somebody going over and, and reviewing each of those uh, each of those components just for some internal consistency and wherever there's uh, wherever there's some discrepancies or inconsistencies trying to, to find out what what the real information is so those are our ten steps um, I know we kind of went through some of this material quickly um, I'm hoping that Cynthia maybe has some questions from the audience but uh, if, if not what we'll do is we'll kind of wrap up here and um, I'll take I'll take my time as I go through some of these wrap-up steps because uh, I, it is such a critical component and when you're when you're dealing with the criminal record search and now that I've kind of spilled the beans and let the secret out that it's it's really matched on name and, and date of birth that, that may cause you to go back and, and reevaluate the way that you're going through this process. Matt, we uh, do have a few questions. Great. Why, don't, why don't we do that before we do your takeaway points? Sure. Uh, one of the things that uh, really is on my mind is with regard to illegal immigrants and they're coming here because they want work and um, I how how do people deal with that with regard to background screening or well, sure, foreign that's, names yeah yeah sure that's that's a that's a huge uh challenge when you're dealing with background checks and you know it's it's unfortunate because this the secret isn't isn't more well known that uh people often assume that because somebody is an undocumented worker that there there's no way to do a, a background check on that individual because well they don't have a social security number so how can i do this well, as I just said, I mean, most criminal records are matched on name and date of birth. Even those who are in the country undocumented, uh, if they are picked up, if they're arrested, they are booked into most systems, and, and that information is recorded and, and stored in the criminal records, the name and date of birth. So if you have an individual that, uh, has, has, uh, that has a criminal record of some sort, uh, whether or not it, they have a social is, is really irrelevant at this point. So... Um, I, again, it's always better to, uh, you know, not assume the negative that it just it, it, there's just no way this level work out. So why should I even bother trying? That's somewhat of a defeatist attitude. I'm always uh, much more uh, positive and, and willing to take 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 a chance and 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 see if it works. And in this case, I can I can confirm that in, it indeed will. So if the individual has a criminal record, you you can still find it. Now, where that creates some challenges is, uh, as, as you asked about the, the foreign names, um, that's why there are actually 33 variants on Matthew. Um, there's Mateo, there's Matthias. Um, so it does, it, most, of, most of your systems will take into account foreign variations and, and foreign spellings. And just like Smith, Jones, Johnson, there are very common names. Uh, uh, common Hispanic names that uh, create lots of matches and where the challenge comes is without the social security number to provide an address history uh, it can it can be somewhat difficult to do that confirmation step um, and that's where you're gonna have to rely upon the applicant um, uh, and then and do some other you know types of uh, you know either reference checks or uh, you know, there there are some other things that that can be done to to help differentiate uh, within with the common names. But it's it's not a lost cause. It can be done. We do it all the time. Uh, Track One actually does a lot of work with religious and nonprofit organizations throughout the country, uh, specifically with the Catholic Church. And in those cases, there's a lot of uh, a lot of undocumented people that are serving as volunteers. And we're able to conduct background checks on those individuals uh, all day, every day. So it's it certainly can it's a ch it's a challenge, but it, it can be met. Well, good. That's good to know. And I I have sort of a follow up information that's somewhat related. I mean, sorry, question. And that is, um, I don't know if you've ever 
had an applicant that you couldn't find information on, but if you have, or if you did have that situation, how do you handle that? Well, a lot of times, um, younger applicants, and we we see this again in the volunteer context. You have some people, you know, some 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 minors or some people who have just reached the age of majority, turned 18, uh, that are that are wanting to volunteer and, and do things, and and so they're young enough that, uh, of course, maybe <laughs> court dramas and and TV shows talking about youthful offenders. That's certainly a problem, but. Yeah, a lot of people have not had much uh, exposure and, and run-ins with the law, and at a, at a young age, they may not have left much of a footprint yet, which uh, seems a little strange in the in the world of social media, which is a whole other topic of conversation. One I think will eventually turn into a webinar. Um, but so the information, the, the, their record may be pretty pretty clean, pretty fresh. Um, when you run a credit check on that individual, or even looking for a credit header. Uh, report uh, they may not have uh, developed a, a credit history uh, same thing with uh, with an address history search they may not have had any addresses uh, that, that kind of tie to them other than the addresses for their parents uh, so it, it does happen um, and in those cases when you come back with a with the with a record that seems almost too clean you just you look at the surrounding factors. You look at the age. Um, there are you know there's some folks that pretty much live credit free and, and are, are cash only. Uh, so you know it, it's it it can sometimes be a challenge. But ultimately you know what we're talking about in terms of doing your background check is it, it's a concept of what what's a reasonable response. Um, you know, one of the reasons that people do background checks in the first place is to uh, avoid the the challenges that can come with a negligent hiring lawsuit. Um, you know, in addition to wanting to provide a safe working environment for their uh, employees and their and their patrons, um, ultimately it kind of boils down to one of the hats that I wear is keeping the lawyers at bay. And so, what you have to look for is, have I done enough? Have I done everything that I can? And if you can answer that question in the affirmative uh, and and feel good about that, then then at at, at some level that's you've, you've done what you can do. Uh, so putting your your uh, young applicants or your undocumented applicants through the same process and just doing doing the best that you can do to look for information, that's going to account for something. Can I tell you that every time you're going to avoid liability? Probably not, uh, but it, it, you've at least, in, in a lot of cases, will have mitigated your, your exposure or mitigated your damages. So Matt, would you say that um, time is your friend when you're going through background screening and getting to know an applicant before you actually hire them? Absolutely, um, and you, you've, you've hit on a, a number of uh, topics there. Um, Time is your friend. Uh, you may feel like you have to rush through and get somebody hired today, and I, I totally get that. We we deal with that all the time, especially on uh, when we're dealing with our, our residential clients, people that are doing uh, screening for for apartments. Uh, you need to get that apartment filled. Somebody needs to have a place to live, and so it, it's a rush, rush, rush. We got to get this done. But in the employment context, let's let's think about that for a minute. I mean, you. Uh, I, I, I know you feel like you have to fill that chair because the, the job is overwhelming and the, your, your staff is going to revolt if you don't get some help, but it, it's, it's better to find Mr. Right than Mr. Right now. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a critical port, part of the, of the onboarding process. Um, and if you're dealing with a background check company that says, I can give you a, a, a nationwide search and it's instant and you'll have you'll have perfect results uh, just you know, as soon as your screen refreshes. They're not telling you the whole story. Um, as we've talked about at length in, on, in the previous webinars, there really is no such thing as a national criminal database. You can't get all records in, into one resource. So the, the, the corollary to that is the good research takes time. And, and so the more time that you spend looking for this information, reviewing this information, the, the better off you'll be. It's, it's really a, a matter of return on investment and, and be willing to take the, the payoff and down the road. Well, you are... Uh, uh, the other issue that you kind of sparked for me with... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. One, the, one, yeah, one more thing that you sparked for me with that comment about, um, you know, about the time 
is a, a lot of states are moving the background check inquiry, or, uh, inquiry further into the application process. There's quite a few states now that have adopted or kind of jumped on this bandwagon called ban the box. And what that refers to is the box on the application that says, have you ever been convicted of a crime? A lot of states are taking that or are asking their employers to take that off the application because it's putting that criminal uh, record inquiry too far forward in the process, uh, feeling like people are getting screened out and not given a, a second chance. And some states have taken that as a step further and said that you can't actually run a background check until an offer of employment has been given. And we, we support that. I mean, we feel that that's a, a good process. Um, we, and we actually carry that process out here at Track 1. Is we always extend a conditional offer of employment subject to the you know, passing a background check. So, but some states are mandating that. So when you say you know, time is your friend, that's, that's, that couldn't be further from the truth because that's, the, that's kind of the growing trend. Matt, um, you are Mr. Right for us today, so I have one more question. And uh, if we, sure. I loved your, I loved that comment. Better to find Mr. Right than Mr. Right now. Oh, that's like okay. We're gonna have to frame that one. Um, you know, and I, I, get, I'm, I think I'm sure I borrowed. I'm sure I borrowed that from a romantic comedy somewhere. <laughs> I know there's so many uses for that. I, I'm just going to have to remember that. Okay, so I want to do one more question only. I want to turn the tables um, in this time instead of thinking like an employer looking to employ someone or a, or a rentor, you know, uh, somebody renting a property and and looking for a lessee. Um, what if we turn the tables now and we say, what if it's yourself, and what would you say on this topic to someone from a personal perspective in terms of trying to make sure that your name has the right information uh, associated with it? Oh, sure. Yeah, and that's, uh, I, again, you're, you're, you, you have a little bit of foresight in, in knowing where some of the, uh, the future webinars are going to go, and I think that's a topic that we've kind of discussed. Um, it, you know, it's, it's really important, especially if you have a, a, a common name, um, to, to know before you go. And, and that is a phrase that, uh, that, that, that we kind of believe, in, and we have a service called Verify My Past. If you go to verifymypast.com, that's a way for individuals to do their own background checks. The, the reason that's so important, um, it's, it's the same reason that justifies going out and, and getting your credit report. Because, uh, you know, a, a lot of times you don't know what gets on there. And sometimes it's wrong. And sometimes information actually belongs to somebody else. And so all the same justifications for doing your own credit check exist for doing your own criminal background check. And, and like I said, it, it's all the more important if you have a common name. Um, there are different background check companies out there, and when you go apply for a job somewhere, you don't know who they use. And so you don't know if it's going to be one of those cheap search, fly by the seat of their pants type operations, or somebody that does more in-depth research. And if they are a cheap database search, you're probably going to have other results that come back uh, that, that could be tied to an, another Brad Smith. So. Knowing before you go and knowing what would possibly come up on a background check uh, before you're in that interview situation or before you're in that uh, uh, leasing office, um, you know you need you need to know what can can, can come up. So yeah, it's it's if if you're if you haven't run your own criminal background check, and there are some places where you can do that online and and kind of get a, a, a very similar experience to what. A, uh, a less reputable company might get, but you know sometimes you need to know what what's what's the worst out there. Uh, but I I would highly recommend that you you look at uh, some of those resources um, and and try to figure out what's what's out there tied to your name. So Matt, if you've um, done your own background screen, you could just present. I mean, if I, I'm sure they want to go run their own, but at least you'd have one to present in a case of of you know confusion and and. Um, misinformation and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's better to be upfront uh, with with your prospective employers. I mean, if if you know that you've had problems in the past, and uh, you know a particular Brad Smith is always showing up on your record, and that no, that's not me. I've been through this before, and here's some of the things that I can show you. Absolutely, go in armed with that knowledge and uh, just let them know in advance because. 
even though companies are required to go through the, the adverse action notification process, as we've, as, as we've documented in some of the previous webinars, it's just an unfortunate fact that not everybody understands, knows, and, and follows the law. So they may, they may see that other Brad Smith record show up on your report and say, eh, next. Um, so before that happens, if, if you know that there are potential problems like that, let them know in advance. And that way they're on notice and they can't just uh, dismiss or uh, you know, not, not do the follow through. So excellent, uh, excellent information. I guess, I guess, unfortunately, we're going to have to go ahead and hear your summary and stop, <laughs> go towards the end of this webinar for today. But I do find this extremely interesting. And I think uh, there will be people who would love to hear about the other side of it, you know, how to protect your own name and that kind of thing. So we'll look forward to that in your future webinars. But go ahead and summarize for us and then we'll, you bet. we'll move to wrapping so it up. So everything that we talked about kind of comes back to the, the, the main topic of, of name matching. And so you understand now that, that uh, just running your applications or running your background checks on the name that shows up that your applicant filled out may not be the best course. Because me, if I filled in Matt Graham, you're not going to find the records that attach to Robert Graham. So now that you know the, the little secret that's out there that uh, I wish was better known, of course we make it known to our clients as we're onboarding. Uh, that all the background checks for your criminal records are, are matched on, on name and date of birth at best. Uh, so it's not as easy as it sounds. It, uh, it requires a little bit of follow-up and, and, and validation on, on some of these things. So uh, also with people like me, Robert, uh, many different variations on that. Matthew, as you now know, uh, Matteo. I think I might try going by Matteo for a day and see how that works out for me. But you understand that these name derivatives are, are important in the, in the process too. So uh, that should be a new question that you ask of your background check company. How do you handle name derivatives? Are you searching for Robert, Robbie, Rob on, on all the checks or, or not? Um, and then go through those 10 steps that we documented and just make sure that each one of those that you've contemplated and incorporated those into your overall background check program. And then at the very end, um, just understand that sometimes the records will slip through the cracks. You will have a situation where you're trying to distinguish one uh, Brad Smith from another. And have you done everything that you can do to pull information on these individuals and find out which one is which? One is which? Um, and then just understand too, as we've documented in, in some of the previous webinars, there's a dispute process and there's an, an adverse action process that, that has to be followed. So you can't just say, well, you can't prove that you're not this Brad Smith. I'm sorry, we can't hire you. Uh, there has to be some time afforded to that individual to clear up the, clear up the, the mismatch or the, or the confusion. And that's where the a reputable background check company comes in. Uh, everyone in our industry is required to, to follow a dispute process mandated by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So ask about that too, as well, uh, of your background check provider. How do they handle disputes? How do they handle um, things that come back and, and can't be totally uh, removed from a record from, from one Brad Smith or another? So um, those are the, the important pieces on the, the name matching. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to, to have this conversation and answer some questions out there. Glad we had some, some participation. So I'm uh, going to turn it back over to you and we'll look at, uh, at next time, which I think We'll be uh, looking at individualized assessment, a topic that we've at least uh, handled a couple times in the past, but this will be a really in-depth look at that uh, topic and, and things that the EEOC is doing and the FTC are doing. Um, we, ha we have some updates on some cases that I think will be uh, really informative to your members. Okay, Matt, very good. I'm going to uh, just take over now your controls and show my screen. And uh, as Matt said, coming up next now, he he or Nancy, they swap off and they do, both do a beautiful job. We'll be back on July 29th, so you're going to want to mark, mark your calendar for that if you'd like to hear about quality decisions through individualized assessments, and I can guarantee it'll be great information. So. Come back, guys. Uh, mark it on your calendars, July 29th.
12 o'clock noon central time. And then switching back to the Business Performance USA, what we have coming up in the next few weeks. We're going to skip July 1st and give folks a, a week off. But we'll be back with a very popular speaker that we have, Kenna Lewis, on July the 8th. She's going to talk about Beyond the Big Three. Now, Kenna is our a very knowledgeable social media queen. She's called, she calls herself a show, socialista, and she truly is. And we have gotten such great information from Kenna in how to engage social media for your business. And she has spoken with us. You can find her webinars out there. Uh, first about planning social media essentials, and then she moved on. And she's been talking about LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and now she's going to go and talk with us, I think, about things like Google Plus and such. So you're going to want to come back uh, the July the 8th and hear her. Then we have, back by popular demand, Kent Stroman. Kent is, is really America's uh, conversational ask. Uh, forget how he says this. Conversation. He's actually America's conversation partner. He is great at the ask. And uh, his career has been focused... Uh, significantly around fundraising, and now he has the Institute for Conversational Fundraising, and uh, he's talking about digging a well before you need water, which has to do with relationship building, especially relationships that you need to ask the big ask. And you want to go and look him up because we have a webinar uh, about asking, how important it is, and how to set it up to where you can get the, the right answer that you want on your big asks. So you want to have um, July the 15th on your calendar for Kent, and then I'm going to be talking with you about five disciplines of high trust leaders on the 22nd. So that gives you the lineup for July. We are so happy that you joined us today, and we always enjoy these webinars as much ourselves as we do. Our executive presenters really enjoy giving them because it helps them really, um, you know, line out they're great expert, expert advice, and so we uh, really appreciate our volunteer executives, uh, Matt, you particularly today, but those coming up as well, and folks, come back, and don't forget to sign up, businessperformanceusa.org, and check out our, our website, because you'll find out all the webinars planned ahead for the next, through August, actually, and uh, join us, and you can get great information here. We'll see you next week. Go out and make it a great day. Bye-bye, everyone.